Welcome, everybody. Um, just a couple of Zoom rules before we get started. During the conversation, we ask participants to turn off their microphone just to ensure a good audio quality. And for that reason, we may mute you if we can hear some background noise. And the chat is open. And feel free to use the chat. It's a great way to share your thoughts with the other participants. And you can also use it to ask questions. And this session will be recorded. So today, we are pleased to host the second installment of The Future Human. And we have with us here today, Satish Kumar. Satish is an activist, former monk, and has been inspiring global change for over 50 years. Inspired by Gandhi, he decided at 18 to undertake a peace pilgrimage, walking without money from India to America in the name of nuclear disarmament. Now in his 80s, Satish has devoted his life to campaigning for ecological regeneration, social justice, and spiritual fulfillment. Satish founded Schumacher College, as well as the Resurgent Trust, an educational charity that seeks a just future for all. And Satish will be in conversation today with our director, Alex Gomez-Marin, a physicist turned neuroscientist who, since 2016, has been head of the behavior of <coughs> laboratory in Alicante, where he is an associate professor of the Spanish Research Council. And with that, I will pass it to you, Alex. Welcome. Thank you so much, Eleanor, as always. All right, Satish, let me start directly by asking, why is it so hard to love oneself? Ah, uh -huh. uh -huh. thank you uh, for that question and thank you for having me uh, for this session. Um, it's hard to love yourself because from the very childhood, we have been told again and again by our teachers, by our parents, that you can do better. It's not good enough. You are not good enough. Mm. We are always criticized mm. rather than appreciated. So we get the idea that I'm not good enough. Mm. I have to be like somebody else. I have to be as good as the other boy or other girl or other person. And so our minds are conditioned to underrate, undervalue, and under-recognize our own capacity, our own um, uh, intelligence, our own creativity, our own imagination, all the good qualities that we have been gifted by the universe, we don't recognize because we have been told again and again by our parents, by our teachers, by our um, senior um, uh, kind of um, elders that you, you are not good enough. This is the, this is the one reason that we uh, have lost uh, the, the kind of capacity to love ourselves. Mm -hmm. And if we don't love ourselves, how are we going to love the world? Yes. That's a very simple question. Because yeah. unless you know who you are, you are not going to know who others are. And unless you are able to love yourself, appreciate who you are, your own good qualities, you are not going to love the other, other people. So I think loving yourself is the first step to love the world and love other people, and love universe, and love everything. Yes, I can see that. It resonates in me. Yet there's a tension, right, between who I am, who we are, and also who we could become. And, <clears throat> and so at the same time that the job or the journey seems to be about discovering who we really are, which is hard, <laughs> there's also this thing in the future, or virtually somewhere, which is who we could become. And in pursuit for that becoming, um, you think do you think we forgot who we are? And that's what leads us astray? Yes. Being and becoming is one continuous process. First thing to first thing to do is to be who we are before we become who we are. Mm. Becoming is only a kind of process of self-realization. Becoming is not something becoming different than who you are. All the potential is already there. But all that potential is kind of locked in a wardrobe of our, our heart mm -hmm. and our soul and our spirit. So mm -hmm. unlocking that potential and to be who we are. We are an artist. We are poets. We are, we are great gardeners. We are great cooks. We are great spiritual beings. We are great lovers. But we have, like, like you have a, a nice dress, 
but you have put it in the wardrobe and locked it and forgotten about it. In the same way, your courage, your imagination, your love, your generosity, your poetry, your art, your music, everything is with you. Everything is there. You don't have to go to Gary Lafayette to buy imagination. You don't have to go to a shopping mall to buy courage. You don't have to go uh, have money to buy uh, creativity. All is gifted to you and me and everyone, every single human being is gifted with those good qualities. But those qualities are forgotten. They are dormant. They are in a, a wardrobe, uh, in a lock and key. And we don't know that we have it. So mm -hmm. our work is to remind people that something is there in your wardrobe. Mm -hmm. Something is there within you, in your soul, in your spirit, in your own uh, being. Just address that and, and, and kind of approach that and, and uncover that and unlock that. And then you can become who you are. So becoming is only to be who you are. Being and becoming are not two separate um, processes, one process. Now, as you're emphasizing remembering, um, the word remember, at least recordar in Spanish, means to go through the heart again. Exactly. Go through the heart again, which um, is very explicitly about love. Yeah. Now, we don't even need a definition because we all kind of know what love is because we felt it, we feel it. But how you, do you define love? Is it this kind of acceptance? There was there, there is this um, this Chilean biologist Humberto Maturana who said also in Spanish very beautifully that amar es dejar aparecer. To love is to let things just manifest or appear by themselves. What's your definition? Yes, I had a great honor and pleasure and privilege of meeting Maturana in in, in Chile. And, uh, and he was a wonderful, wonderful man. And he also came to teach at Schumacher College. So I had a good opportunity to meet with him. And yes, I think he is absolutely right. I totally agree with him. Uh, to love is to accept what is. Hmm. First of all, you accept yourself, who you are. Hmm. And you are a unique being. There's no other person like you. Each and every one of us are a unique gift. Uh, even though we are all humans, we all have two eyes and two ears and two arms and two legs and, and body and so on and brain. And yet every one of us are unique. Mm -hmm. So accepting yourself as you are and accepting yourself who you are and, and loving yourself. And loving yourself is not ego. Loving yourself is not pride. Loving yourself is not arrogance. Loving yourself is also very humble. You have to be who you are in humility and, and, and therefore you can prepare yourself to love others. You don't say that I love myself more than I love somebody else. Um, like you feed yourself uh, so that you can serve others. You feed yourself so you can look after your children, you can look after your parents, you can look after your neighbors. So feeding yourself is not selfish. In the same way, uh, accepting yourself, who I am, without condemning yourself, without undervaluing yourself, is not selfish, it's not egotistical, it's not arrogant, it's not uh, pride, it's a humility. In mm. humility, I recognize and accept myself who I am. And mm. then I practice uh, my mm. skills. And I practice to be a poet, to be an artist, to be a great gardener, to be a good cook, to be a good lover, to be a good father, whatever I am. Uh, and, and to be good does not mean that you have to be famous, doesn't mean that you have to be in the newspapers, doesn't mean that you have to be known, doesn't matter. As long as with love, you are contented, you are fulfilled, you enjoy your life, you have a celebration, your joy, you have what we call in India, ananda. So we have ananda, we have a joy and a blissful living and we are happy and contented within ourselves. That is to me, is true acceptance of yourself and that is love. And when you accept yourself, then you drop expectations. 
Mm -hmm. You don't expect anything uh, more than what you are. You don't expect other people to behave in a certain way or do certain things according to your idea of good work. Um, so no expectations, drop expectations of every kind and accept yourself and accept others as they are, who they are, without criticism, without complaining, without controlling, without comparing, without judging. No mm -hmm. judgment, accept yourself, accept others, who they are, who you are, and then you have a relationship. And through relationship, you participate in the process of living. And you participate in the process of living, and in that participation, you transform yourself and you transform others. Others help to transform you, and you help to transform mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. So radical love, my book is called Radical Love, is not passive love, it's mm -hmm. active love. It's mm -hmm. active love. And active love is this participation and, and working together and, and exploring together and, and growing together. So that's a kind of all love is mutual. All love, is, and all flourishing is mutual. All thriving is mutual. So love is that mutuality, that reciprocity, the relationship. So, so loving yourself is preparing yourself to love others so that you can cultivate that relationship of acceptance total acceptance without judgment. That's what I call radical love rather than just moderate love. Such radical love, which means going to the roots at the same time, right? The word radical. So it go, it's going deep. It, is this something humanly possible? Meaning, is it, and I suppose the answer is yes, but to what extent this idea, the idea of radical love, it's something we can actually embody. Do you embody it? Do you think we embody sometimes, uh, if you're lucky during the day, this radical love, not just any love, but this one? Yeah, yeah. The radical love uh, is not easy. Uh, it, it's, uh, you have to, like um, uh, being a violinist, it's not easy. You have to practice every single day. Mm. Uh, you have to devote yourself in the same way you can learn to love. It's a skill. Like you can learn to speak Spanish, Spanish. You can learn to speak Italian. You can learn to play violin and piano. You can learn to paint pictures. You can learn to dance. You can learn to love. Mm -hmm. And radical love, which is different and higher than moderate love, is to love even those you don't like. Yeah. Love even those with whom you don't agree. Even those you think a whole world thinks is a bad person or bad something. Yeah, the love, I mean, if you are a Christian, Jesus Christ says, love uh, your enemy, meaning love anybody who, so you don't say that I will love only good people. Mm -hmm. I will love only those who are um, nice and, and, and lovable. No, no, you, radical love is to go to the deep roots of love. And the deep root is to love everyone without exception without any um, kind of uh, discrimination, without any judgment. Like nature loves us without any judgment. Mm -hmm. A tree does not discriminate between a king or a, a, a beggar. A tree does not, an apple tree does not say that only uh, good people can eat my apples and mm -hmm. bad people, sinners and prisoners and, and, and beggars, they cannot eat my apples. Mm -hmm. Only good people can eat apples, no. Apples are there for everyone without any discrimination, without any judgment. Water does not say that only kings and, and saints can drink my water. Water will quench the thirst of everybody. So we, our love is like apple, uh, apples and water and air. Apple, love is non-discriminatory. Even if you are a sinner, even if you are a prisoner, even if you are a bad person, still love it's unconditional. So that is the that, that is a radical love. Hmm. Even if the enemy wants to kill you and kill you, or to make it less personalized, you were referring to nature. I think about nature often being a city boy, and there's this romantic view of nature, and we need to recover it, like mother nature, nurturing and full of creativity and offering the fruits and so on. But but nature is also terrifying. Right, like if you go to the mountain as a, as a simple human being and you spend there three weeks, 
well, you can easily die. It can kill you, right? So, so how to conciliate this love with, with death and suffering, which is amongst us humans and also, I mean, within nature itself, herself. No, no. Uh, love is also tough love. Mm. Radical love is also tough love. So, so when you have uh, somebody like Martin Luther King, uh, I had the privilege of uh, meeting Martin Luther King after my journey from India to America on, on foot for peace. I met Martin Luther King and he was an embodiment of what you call tough love because mm. he was standing up against the racism and against, against the discrimination and segregation. And in his 10 years of activism, he was put in jail for 29 times. And yet he was the embodiment of love. So, mm. so, so it is not that, um, I mean, nature you say, uh, uh, but I mean, of course nature is powerful, no doubt. And you can have a storm and you can have wind and you can have heavy rain and heavy snow and even sometimes earthquake, um, all that is possible. But uh, that is, Earth, there are two reasons for Earth having an earthquake or something like that. One is um, that we, Earth is adjusting itself in its own evolution, because Earth is evolving. And in evolution, there's a pain. Love does not mean that there's no suffering. Love does not mean there's no pain. Pain and suffering are part of life. Buddha mm -hmm. said that the first noble truth is suffering exists, pain exists. Mm -hmm. So Earth is trying to evolve like giving birth to a child is painful, labor. Uh, uh, you have to go through life and death experience. A mother is a hero because she goes through life and death experience to give yeah. birth to a child. That, that don't mean that there's no love. Hmm. So, so uh, difficult or circumstances when earth is trying to evolve and adjust itself, there are difficulties, there are suffering, but still earth loves you. You put one seed in the ground, it will be, give you a tree and it will give you thousands upon thousands of apples year after year um, for 20 years. That is the generosity of, of nature. And, and so, and water will quench your thirst wherever you are. And the air, you, you breathe without air breathing, uh, you cannot live for a minute or five minutes. And so whole body, you are breathing. So mm. nature is in the main benign. The scientists have mistakenly said, nature red in tooth and claw. That's a completely wrong science. Science has got it wrong. Um, nature is benign. Nature is beneficial. Nature is in the service and love of humanity and love of all living beings. And so I, I'm a romantic maybe, but I prefer to be romantic than be this kind of a reductionist scientist. Hmm. Yeah, I would say so am I, or I try. Now, let me pursue this a bit more and then I'll go, I want to move to something else. So there is place within this radical love for actually suffering and even for war you would say there is place within it or yeah, when I we're mean, when we're at war and suffering we're kind of away from this radical love and we need to come back to it yeah yeah i mean war is slightly we are in the age of nuclear bombs nuclear weapons and in this age of nuclear weapons war has become obsolete and and if if um, if humanity goes that far i would say that is not uh, a radical love. I would say every conflict and war now should be possible to negotiate and find a common ground and a common uh, common um, interest and find a mutual solution so that neighbors can live next to each other. Like Jesus Christ said, love your neighbor. So Ukrainians have to learn to love Russians and Russians have to learn to live, uh, love Ukrainians. Uh, the, uh, the Catalonians have to learn to love Spanish and Spanish have to learn uh, Catalonians and Kashmiris have to learn and Hindus have to learn love Muslims. So we have to love, uh, learn to love our neighbors. I don't think at this age of nuclear age, I can justify war at any circumstances or any condition. That's kind of beyond pale. Oh, but pain and suffering has a place in love, like uh, birth 
and like uh, illness, uh, like uh, sometimes you have uh, neighbors where like uh, racism, imperialism, colonialism, and so all those things are there. And then we, through love, we negotiate, we uh, stand up against it, and we go to jail. Um, Nelson Mandela was in jail for 27 years out of love for humanity, and 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 he suffered. So that's a different matter. Non-violent resistance, uh, peaceful resistance, like Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa, Bangari Mathai, many, many good examples are there. So suffering, pain are part of our life. But war is something beyond. That's a kind of stupid now. Wars are not fought by humans. Wars are fought by drones and, 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 um, and the bombs and machines and technology. Humans are not really uh, a kind of uh, showing any courage or any, although they die, but they don't have any skill of fighting. So war has become obsolete in my radical love philosophy. Hmm. I see, that's clear. Thank you, Satish. Let me go one more step, one more step, Perhaps too metaphysical, although it just <laughs> suffices to say metaphysical or even theological. What's the place of love in an uni in a universe where one could say there's also evil? Do you believe evil exists? And if it does, what has happened to it with respect to radical love? Yeah. I mean, the thing is that you can say good and evil is a kind of our mental formation, our idea of good and evil. But when you are in radical love, you transcend the duality, the dualism, the separation. And good and bad go through every human heart. There's no one person 100% good and no one person 100% bad. Good and bad go through every human heart every single human heart. So there's no, you, I don't say that this person is totally evil and that person is totally good. This is no such thing. And so Rumi, the great Sufi poet and Sufi master said, there's a field beyond right and wrong, beyond good and bad, beyond good and evil. I meet you there. So mm -hmm. we in radical love, we have to transcend uh, this duality this dualism of separation between uh, condemning one and, and praising another. And we have to say dark and light go together. Yin and yang go together. So, um, so uh, 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 there's a little bit of hatred there in every human heart. There's anger there, there's a fear there, there's anxiety there. These things are there. We cannot mm -hmm. be completely free because we are humans. So we cannot be free, but at the same time, there's a more love and more compassion and more kindness and more generosity than anger, fear, anxiety, and all the kind of evil things that you think about. But those things are like yin yang. Mm -hmm. I don't call it evil as such there. And this is evil and this is good. That kind of dualism does not fit in my understanding of radical love. Yeah. What you're saying at the same time is very radical and also I think very appropriate to what we're trying to do here with the topic, quote unquote, of the future human, because you mentioned transcendence. And so I wanted to talk about types of change. There is change, there is translation, there is transformation, there is transfiguration, and maybe there is transcendence. So yeah. to put human and transcendence together is it's scary to many people, even those who reject the transhumanist agenda. What kind of human transcendence are we talking about? Because it sounds and probably is a very spiritual notion. It is spiritual notion, yes. But then we are spirit. We are not just body. We are body and spirit. We are body and soul. We are matter and spirit together. <clears throat> so there is no um, kind of going away from the spirituality. So human spirit is <clears throat> as important as human body. And so through spirituality, we transcend. Through body, through matter, we are rooted and through spirit, we transcend. So spirit word comes from air, spirit, inspirare, to breathe in, in, expirare, to breathe out. And when you are stopping breathing, you are expired. And so, so, so air rises, air rises, matter comes down, matter is solid. So it's rooted. So matter solid, and spirit, air, transcending. 
rising above. So in that situation, when you are meeting um, somebody and, and you see something which you don't agree at something, then you have to rise above that different opinion. You have to rise above the kind of petty differences and see that there is a unity in humanity. There's a much more together we can do and work together and love each other than a quarrel and fight and, 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 and get into, uh, into a kind of dilemmas. So transcending is an essential ingredient for a good life. Mm -hmm. and, and, and transcendence is not just a flaky, wishy-washy, um, otherworldly idea. Transcendence is a very practical and very pragmatic and very necessary ingredients of our human contentment and human happiness and human joy. If you want to be contented and joyful and happy, you have to learn to transcend. If you are bogged down all the time, like body and matter, and not have a spirit, uh, then you are not going to be very happy. So transcend is a very pragmatic and very practical and very useful and very, in my life, I have found that when I am able to transcend the dualism and the separation and a kind of pettiness, then I'm much more contented and happy. Mm. Wow, this is intense. I see. Okay. So now we, we've talked about love oneself, love your neighbor, love thy enemy. Now, honor your mother and your father, right? More commandments here. With, with respect to the mother, mother nature, that's clear, although not easy. You will only need to see how we treat her. Tell me a bit more about love, loving our father. Because if we talk about Mother Nature, we don't often talk about, what is it, Father Heaven? It is as if the Father is more absent than the Mother, regardless of how we treat them. You see what I mean? Yes. I mean, you know, the indigenous wisdom, uh, many, many indigenous cultures, Aboriginal cultures, and the, uh, and the uh, American Indians, the Mayan culture, uh, many other indigenous wisdom keepers have said, Father sky and mother earth. So father is as important as mother. Without father and mother together, without feminine and masculine together, without yin and yang together, it becomes a kind of monoism. Monoism. Mm -hmm. Neither monoism nor dualism, mm -hmm. but relationship. So father um, principle is there everything, in everything. Uh, in every human body, there is a um, feminine and there's a masculine. We say that listening is feminine and speaking is masculine. Everybody mm -hmm. has two ears and everybody has one mouth. So we need to speak. We need to learn to speak. We also need to learn to receive and, and listen. So, but ears are two and mouth is one. So we need two part feminine and one part masculine. Mm -hmm. So we talk more about mother nature because we need to have more feminine love, mm -hmm. compassion, caring, sharing, receiving. All these things are more uh, appropriate and necessary. Uh, therefore, uh, F2M, like water is made of H2O. Mm -hmm. um, we are made of F2M, two part feminine, mm -hmm one part yeah. masculine. Yeah. So we talk more about mother nature only because we are two part feminine mm -hmm. and one part masculine. But I always honor the masculinity. Each mm -hmm. and every um, man I say, don't lose your masculinity because if you lose your masculinity, you are losing something. Masculine mm -hmm. and feminine are two great gifts from the universe. And we have to celebrate our masculinity as well as our femininity. And mm. every man can be feminine as well as masculine. And every woman can be as much masculine as feminine. So we are a combination of feminine and masculine. And so Mother Nature and the Father Sky and Mother Earth and all the great spirit, I think the American Indian and, and the uh, South American Indian and the Aboriginal, Indi Ab Aboriginal pe uh, uh, indigenous people, all mm. these people have that wisdom. And we are in modern uh, industrial societies and the technological societies and scientific age, age of enlightenment. We have forgotten that balance and therefore we have become too masculine and, and controlling and, and organizing and managing. So our neuroscience, uh, it tells us that we have become too left brain oriented mm -hmm. uh, and, and we have forgotten the right brain. This is why 
we need to bring this left brain and right brain in balance. And there's a wonderful teacher called Ian McGilchrist. And he came to Shimaka College to teach. And he and I taught together a course called Balancing the Brain. So balancing the brain is the right hemisphere of the brain and the left hemisphere of the brain together. So masculine and feminine together. Mm -hmm. So uh, so as much we admire Mother Earth, we also have to admire Father Sky. And without the sun and without the sky, there can be no earth. So we have to celebrate the sun as much as the soil. Thank you for that. Especially in these rather politically incorrect times um, to at least mention those that polarity and the balance between, between the polarity. Now, I wanted to talk to you about activism as well. Yes. I don't consider myself an activist, or at least all the activist activism I do is through my writings and through Zoom and probably with my own daughters and wife, but it doesn't go beyond that. You are a true activist. Now, I must share a concern or maybe a stupid a stupid doubt I have about activism, which is to say, we need to change, we need to change, but what if we don't want to change despite that we need to change? Because repeating it sometimes works, but often doesn't unlock that change you're pursuing through activism. So, so give me a kind of a very um, basic notion of what activism attempts and whether or why it is successful or it is not. Now, activism comes in many forms. There's no one single definition of activism. Activism can be a great gardener setting up a good example of organic, sustainable, regenerative gardening is an activist. A great, uh, a, an artist like Picasso. Picasso painted Guernica. That was a great activism, mm -hmm. a, 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 a statement of activism for peace. And that one painting of Guernica changed the consciousness of many, many hum human beings. Um, many people have used song uh, like John Lennon or John Byers or Bo uh, um, um, Bob Dylan or um, uh, all these great uh, singers and many, many others all around the world, Tagore um, and many others. They, through their singing, they have been activists. So activism comes in many forms. That's the first thing to remember. Secondly, Activism is to be the change that you want to see in the world. Mm -hmm. You don't want to just preach and teach and demonstrate and, and tell other people to change without you changing. So activism is an example of being the, the kind of person uh, that um, is uh, sustainability, regenerative, um, and contented, uh, without destruction, without pollution, without waste, all those things, you have to be the change. So the first step of activism is to be the change that you want to see in the world. But then we are streets of communication. We have to communicate the change. The change is the eternal principle. If you say, I don't want to change, then you are living in the illusion. You cannot remain unchanged. You are growing from child to young, young to middle age, middle age to old. That's a change. Uh, you are changing from uh, winter to summer uh, and, and, and a spring to autumn. That's a change. Um, change is eternal principle of life. And mm. therefore, if you did not change, imperialism will not go. Colonialism will not go. Racism will not go. Apartheid will not go. Berlin Wall will, will not go. Things will not change. Everything becomes static. So change is necessary. That's a, a part of natural process. So we have to accept the change is necessary. Now, what kind of change? That's all you can, you can say. What kind of change? So what I will say, change should come which does no harm to others. Non-violent change. Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, they preach change, but non-violent change. So like a doctor practices medicine, he brings the change in health. Uh, through surgery, through medicine, through uh, exercise, whatever. But uh, doctor takes an oath of doing no harm, Hippo the Hippocratic oath. So in the same way, we take this oath uh, when we are activists, that we will do no harm to anyone. We will not kill anyone. There is no cause good enough for which I can kill somebody. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are good causes for which I, I can die. 
but there is no good cause for which I can kill anybody. So that non-violent change, that radical love change, that transformation, as we, we have seen uh, Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, and many, many others. So that kind of change, which does no harm, and even you love people who are uh, victims of that particular system, like colonialism, imperialism, apartheid, racism, sexism, nationalism, uh, uh, religious bigotry, any, any kind of thing. You love people and yet you want to grow, you want to evolve. Evolution is part of our, our existence. Without evolution, without change, we cannot exist. So, so change is necessary, change is um, fundamental, change is part of our existence. But non-violent change and bring mm -hmm. about with optimism. You, mm -hmm. If you want to be an activist, you have to be an optimist. Change will come and people will transform. If you are not an optimist, then you can be a journalist, but not an activist. Mm -hmm. You have to have a hope, active hope and active love go together. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so with great active hope and optimism, I am an activist and I, I am... And what is activism? Activism is to serve the society, serve other people, bring goodness to those who are poor, those who are exploited, those who are victims of uh, um, victims mm. of a system uh, by which they are in war or in poverty or in uh, some kind of uh, degradation and segregation and discrimination. So serving people with a sense of service, you are giving your life um, and rising above your self-interest in the interest of the whole humanity and whole society. That is activism. You cannot do without activism. Buddha was an activist. Jesus Christ was an activist. St. Francis was an activist. Um, and Mahatma Gandhi was an activist. We are all activists. We have to be an activist to serve the others. And therefore, we need to give our life. Yes, yes, yes. Wow. Now, help me refine here the do no harm principle and help me refine our understanding of violence. And let me just put you something, some, an example that, that will, will sound silly, but from, from here, maybe we can get a, a better understanding. Of course, this is not about going and killing people around, but what about the doctor who's um, treating a kid who's had his shoulder displaced? And of course, the doctor needs to push the shoulder and it will create at least pain in the kid, right? There's a balance there. Maybe it's not harm. Or let's say another example when you know, or you think, or you feel you need to tell your friend something that he or she doesn't want to hear. And probably when you tell that thing, it's going to harm the person. I mean, it's going to create something in that person, which maybe it's not evil or wrong, but certainly it's not something nice or pleasant. So no. how do we go from these extremes? Alex, there is a difference between pain and violence. Violence is violating somebody else's life. So violence is different. Pain is part of existence. We are born in pain. We get headache, we get tummy ache, we get pain. Pain is not violence. Pain is part of living, uh, part of being born. And uh, we die, we get become ill, we become old. They're all pain is not violence. Violence is intention to harm. If you have intention to harm somebody, then it is violence. And you are harming somebody else for your own self-interest. Then it is violence. So violence and pain should not be equated. They are two different things. There can be pain. Pain is first noble truth in Buddhism. Uh, suffering is first noble truth. But intentionally harming somebody yeah. and trying to harm somebody for your own self-interest or selfishness, that is violence. Now... At the risk of sounding cynical here, good intentions can do a lot of harm, right? Even good intentions, even activism. You would say perhaps that's not true activism, but even good hard intentions can be totally destructive. How no, to, if, how... you're, if, you're, if you are acting non-violently and having good intention, then uh, as far as I understand it, uh, good motivation, good intention, and good action go together. There's no dualism. There's no separation between good action and good intention. So if your intention is good and your action is good, then I think that is 
um, that is the way. Uh, your intention and action should go together. Mm, I see. Okay, let's speak about love of ideas. Yes. Because we, there are so many types of loves and, and, and perhaps we can relate it to the do no harm. There are ideas that do harm and there are others that don't. Maybe it's too abstract to say because ideas need to kind of come and become embodied in a context, in a society, in a, in a particular situation. But what can you say about love of ideas? Love of ideas is good, uh, but ideas need to have two centers. I mean, we know the world, like, you know, Jung talked about four ways of knowing the world. Intuition, thinking, sensing, and feeling. So the ideas are more related to thinking. That thinking should be in balance and harmony with our intuition and with our feelings, which is heart-centered. Thinking and ideas are more brain-centered, mind-centered, where the feeling is more heart-centered. And then sensing with our eyes and with our ears and with our body and with our touch, we sense things. So if you can put those four in balance together, then love of ideas has a very good place. And love of ideas is what we learn Buddhism, we learn uh, Taoism, we learn um, uh, Spinoza, we learn philosophy, we learn poetry. Ideas are good, but ideas should not be isolated, should not be separated from intuition and from feeling and from sensing. If ideas are tested uh, with sensing, and with feeling and with intuition, then that love of ideas has a very important place. Mm -hmm. Because without ideas, all our books will not be there. All our literature will not be there. All our philosophy will not be there. Our grammar will not be there. So ideas are extremely important. But what has happened is that they become too academic and too intellectual. And we have lost the sense of intuition and feeling and sensing. And we have just saying ideas, ideas, ideas. And therefore, that's a very left brain. And, 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 and ideas um, become very logical and very kind of rational and very kind of pure reason and, and a scientific and academic. Then ideas become uh, either unhelpful or even dangerous, um, mm. like ideas of communism, ideas of free market, or ideas of socialism. All those ideas um, lack feeling and mm. lack sensing and lack intuition and lack spirituality and therefore, I think ideas have a place, but only in the context of and with bad in balance with other parts of our learning. And that's I think Jungian uh, Jungian psychology gets it right. Yeah, yeah. I see all these isms at the end already betray that these ideas are forgetting something important, right? Every time we have an ism. Yeah, exactly. Because when you put ideas, then you have to also say what is truth behind these ideas. And there's no one single truth. Truth is a multifaceted diamond. It has many, many faces and many, many dimensions. So if you put ism, like capitalism, communism, socialism, uh, materialism, any ism, meaning one idea is put above all mm. other ideas. So mm. I would say make all isms wasms. <laughs> no good ism. Ism is putting one idea above the other idea. Mm. But the love of idea is to explore all ideas. Explore. We need uh, capital without capitalism. We need communities without communism. We need society without socialism. We need matter without materialism. So ism is for me more problematic. So ideas within the balance. I think idea have to dance together with sensing, intuition and feeling uh, and spirituality then ideas have a very important place. But ideas are disconnected from spirituality, disconnected with feeling, disconnected with relationship, and putting my idea better than your idea, and fighting over ideas, free market idea, or communism idea, or socialist idea, then idea can become an obsession. Christianity better than Hinduism, or Hinduism better than Islam, or Islam is better than Buddhism. That kind of ideas become kind of dangerous. So ideas have to be with humility and in balance with other faculties of our being. Satish, your, your energy is beautiful. <laughs> thank you thank so you, much. Thank you. Thank this you. is being vibrant. Okay, love of God. Yeah. Let me, let me 
just paraphrase it or prologue it by saying, what we've been discussing could sound too much of a voluntarist attitude. What's the role of grace in all we're talking about? Not just will and practice and skill, but grace. And is it related to a good understanding of love of God? Now, first of all, God is not a separate uh, being or person somewhere in heaven. Mm -hmm. God is an energy. God is a principle present everywhere. God is imminent. God is present in every tree, in every animal, in every bird, in every river, in every human being, in every, every part of our existence. So God is not a being separate from the world. God is an energy, an energy like quantum physics Energy is everywhere. So God is everywhere. So love of God is radical love. Because love of God means love of everything. Love of water, love of nature, love of forest, love of trees, love of animals, love of birds, love of action, love of poetry, love of humans, love of yourself. Love everywhere, without any exception, is love of God. So for me, there's no dualism and separation between God and existence. Existence, the God is an existential principle rather than uh, rather than um, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, above something. So in that sense, uh, love of God is the ultimate love, is the highest form of love because you are loving without any discrimination and without any judgment uh, because because everything is sacred. A sense of the sacred is essential in having love of God. So you see that sense of sacred in everything. Trees are sacred, life is sacred, rivers are sacred. So if you go to India, Hindus worship river Ganges. Ganga is sacred. Hindus go to Mount Kailash because Mount Kailash and Himalayas are sacred. Hindus worship trees because trees are sacred. Hindus worship a cow and a peacock because peacock and cows are sacred. So that sense of the sacred is what I call love of God. Hmm. Now, grace, I want to insist on grace being this kind of descent, if we, if we may call it, could be an ascent, but a descent of something that's not, even, even not deserved, you see, by, by this will or this practice to be an, a loving activist in the world. It, it sounds like a miracle and it probably is. What's the role of grace? Yes, grace is a miracle, and, and I love miracles, and miracles, uh, miracles happen. So grace is like God. We all have that graciousness um, uh, potential within us. And, 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 and so we can contemplate grace, and grace can come to us from the universe. And as we said, the sense of the sacred and sense of God in every existential um, reality, then that grace comes to us and we give grace back to the universe. So it's a kind of mutuality and reciprocity. It's an interconnectedness, the interrelatedness of grace. Through grace, we are connected. Through grace, we are interrelated. Mm -hmm. Through grace, we are interdependent. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so being gracious is to be in harmony with ourselves and to be gracious, being in harmony with all our surroundings. And so we, and I think we talked about transcendence. So transcendence and grace are also connected. When you transcend duality and good and bad and go beyond uh, dualism, then you have that graciousness of accepting and that's a love. So grace is fundamentally um, beautiful and, and an inspiring uh, ideal. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we can all have, we can all have that. And, and potentially we do, uh, we, can, we can cultivate to be gracious and we can cultivate to give grace and we can cultivate to receive grace and be gracious. Would praying be one of those practices? Because we've been told that praying is kind of a psychological hijack, self-help, but do you see in praying something more ontological than just one talking to oneself? No, no. Praying is basically uh, 
using the power of positive thought. Thought and thinking has a great power. We underestimate the power of positive thought. And so when you say, I pray for Putin, the whole world prays for Putin to be wise and peaceful, I think Putin can be transformed. Mm -hmm. At the moment, everybody's praying that Putin should be killed or Putin should be defeated. And therefore, uh, that's the kind of prayer happening. Uh, but if the whole world was praying that um, we should end poverty, poverty will come to an end. Uh, if we whole world together, this, this like, prayer has a collective power as well as an individual power. Mm -hmm. And I think power of collective prayer is very powerful. Uh, and also, but, but collective prayer cannot start without individual prayer. Each and every one of us have to join in. If I say, I wish everybody else will pray, but I don't join in, then it will never happen. So I start with myself and, and, and other people join in. But when it becomes a kind of a collective prayer from most of the humanity or large part of humanity, then that has a great power. So power of positive thinking, power of prayer is immense. But I, I think we don't pray enough um, with our total commitment and sincerity. Prayer has become a kind of ritual. Prayer has become a kind of habit. We think oh, I'm praying, uh, but your heart is not in it. You are not totally sincere. You are not totally present. Then it's not powerful. Power of prayer is when you are totally concentrated in that moment of prayer and you are doing without judgment, without criticism, without malice, without negative feeling, and you have a total love in your heart. And may all beings, including people who are uh, in war or people who are fighting, even they should be well. And I, I wish them wisdom and I wish them happiness. I wish Putin wisdom and happiness and joy and a good health then that kind of prayer is transcending from this political dualism and, and uh, he is bad and I'm good, that kind of thing. So power of positive thinking through prayer is immense. Hmm. Thank you for that as well. Let me just mention a couple of things and then we'll open it up for questions and comments. Um, we, we inhabit an evolutionary universe. At least I, li I like to think we are and I think we are. Does love evolve in that universe? Yes. Love okay. evolves. Yeah. Love evolves. Our minds are evolving. Our consciousness is evolving. There was a wonderful philosopher in India called Sri Aurobindo. And he had this, this um, uh, uh, teaching that we are evolving towards a supra mind. And that supra mind is a mind of love. That supra mind, supra nature. Uh, is a kind of super mind, and the super mind is non dualistic and non discriminatory, um, inclusive rather than exclusive. So it includes everything, and therefore, uh, love evolves. We are evolving, we are becoming more loving, more peaceful, uh, more inclusive, uh, and more um, kind of we are rising above many, many kind of dualistic thinking like sexism and racism. Uh, we are moving away from that. And even there is a much more uh, awareness about the relationship between humans and nature. We always thought that nature is separate from humans and, and we don't have to use love nature, we have to just use nature. The value of nature was considered only in terms of nature's usefulness and nature's monetary uh, uh, value, um, how much money this nature can give me. And that is changing. And we are evolving and now we are saying that humans are also nature and the value of nature is not only in terms of her usefulness to humans, but value of nature is intrinsic. Mm -hmm. Nature has intrinsic value. That kind of awareness is evolution of love, love for nature. Mm -hmm. Whereas our, when our, in the uh, last century or hundred years ago, <clears throat> when Francis Bacon said, uh, the scientist who said that we have to steal the secrets of nature. We have to exploit nature. Nature is only a resource for the economy. That idea is now changing. And we are saying that no, 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 nature and humans are one. That's the evolution of love. Yes. Yes. Wonderful, Satish. Okay. Last thing. I recently heard you make this distinction between 
being a pilgrim and being a tourist in the way we inhabit the world and our lives. And this really helped me because I have this feeling that I belong to the world, but at the same time that I don't, or that it, not only that it doesn't belong to me, but that I'm not really 100% belonging to the world. And, and this idea of being in the world, this being in the world as a pilgrim, it's, yeah. it's just fantastic. So I would like to end with your comments on that. Yes, absolutely. On this planet Earth, we can live in with two kinds of consciousness. One is the consciousness of being a tourist, and the other is the consciousness of being a pilgrim. Now, if you are a pilgrim, your footprint on the planet Earth will be lighter because you are not so consumerist. You are not demanding so much. You are not taking, taking, taking. A tourist is always taking. Uh, a tourist wants a good hotel a good um, a cinema or a good museum or a good sightseeing or good some, something for their own sort of pleasure. But a pilgrim has a very light footprint and they are accepting life as it comes. Um, and therefore they don't exploit nature. They don't exploit other people. They live in harmony with other people. So I would like to say that we need to cultivate the consciousness of being a pilgrim on this planet earth. We are earth pilgrims rather than uh, tourists on this planet. We have, we have come here as guests of the planet Earth. And, and planet Earth is giving us air, water, fruit, vegetables, herbs, flowers. Um, uh, everything is being provided to us. But we take only what is our real need and necessity and allow other pilgrims to also enjoy their share. And therefore, don't take anything more than your real need and, and more than what Earth can actually give you. If that is a kind of uh, simple and elegant and humble approach to life and humble approach to Earth, then you are in the consciousness of a pilgrim. Pilgrim does not mean only that you have to be on Camino Santiago de Compostela and go to uh, Assisi or go to Rome or go to Jerusalem, then you are a pilgrim. That's only a symbolic. When you are walking Camino de Santiago and, 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 and Camino uh, de Assisi, then you are practicing that mentality, that mindset, that consciousness, that psychology of being light-footed, meaning you are walking, so you're not, not using car, you are not using hotels, you are not using um, taxis, you are, not, you are using less material things. And you're just using your two legs and being humbly walking in nature and, and being in harmony with nature. If that kind of mindset can remain with you all the time and you take from nature only what your real, true need and, and leave the rest for the others to enjoy and, and then be gratitude, have a gratitude, graciousness and gratitude go together. You asked about grace. Gracious attitude is gratitude. So grace and gratitude go together. So if we have a sense of gratitude to nature and thank you, trees, for giving me um, oxygen and fruit and thank you, earth, for holding my two feet on your back and thank you, um, my house, um, for providing me a bed for the night, that kind of gratitude, that kind of thanksgiving, that is a pilgrim's mindset. That's a pilgrim's consciousness. So I, if we want to save our planet Earth and we want to stop climate change and, and a biodiversity diminishing and, and the ocean being polluted with plastic and rivers polluted with sewage and soil polluted with chemicals and fertilizers, we want to stop all that, then we have to change our consciousness of being a tourist and become pilgrims. Then we will not pollute our oceans and our rivers and climate change. They will not put so much carbon emission in our atmosphere. So being a pilgrim is an imperative for the age of ecology. Satish, my deepest gratitude for being here, for your work, for your presence, for your time, for sharing this moment with all of us. Thank you. Thank you. It's Satish. my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you both. And now it's time to open it up to the rest of you. 
Um, if you would like to ask a question to Alex and Satish, you can use your the raise your hand function that you can find under reactions at the bottom of your screen. And otherwise, you can write your question in the chat or you can raise your hand physically and I'll try to, to call you out. Matt, please come in. Well, thank you, Satish. Great. So I, I heard you speak about 25 years ago at Schumacher College. Um, okay. It was on a DB Ecology course. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, excellent. It was a good memory. It was a long time ago. And and at the time, you talked about, you know, in, in a dark world, you'd light a candle. Yeah. To light it up rather than allowing the darkness. Yeah. And we were all candles, potentially. I just, just a quick question. I just wondered, in the last 25 years, do you feel the world has got darker? No, no. The world has gone also lighter as much as sometimes it had also gone darker. And we still have to light a candle, then curse the darkness, because cursing darkness, darkness will not go away. By lighting a candle, darkness will be reduced. And so um, the world has gone both ways. On the one hand, we have much more problem of, with climate change, carbon emission, and even going to war in Ukraine is going backwards after nearly 50 years of peace. Uh, we are going backward and having war. So there are negative things uh, which are kind of worrying. But at the same time, there are lots of good things happening. There's a much more renewable energy now than uh, 20, 30, 50 years ago. There's a much more plant-based diet now. Many more people are eating plant-based diet, vegetarian diet, than 20, 30, 40 years ago. There are many, many more people are uh, living a more frugal life and, and bicycling and walking and, and more ecological. And there's much more, many more people are familiar with yoga and meditation and, and, and health issues and, and so on. And, and so I think that, I mean, for example, Schumacher College and Pari uh, Institute, these sort of um, organizations are emerging. So there are lots of good things are happening because people like you and me have been uh, lighting a candle rather than cursing the darkness. We have been starting Shimaka College. We have been starting Pari Institute. We have started um, uh, many organic farms. I was in, uh, in Italy, uh, Fattoria La Viala, which is a wonderful organic biodynamic farm. 50 years ago, that did not exist. So there are many, many good things are also happening. And the world is coming together. And, and we are communicating with each other and, and learning from each other. So both things are going at the same time. And I hope that we can light more candles and reduce the war, reduce climate change, reduce um, carbon emission, reduce um, uh, the destruction of biodiversity and pollution of oceans and rivers and, and destruction of our rainforest. If we can reduce that uh, side by side, increasing renewable energy and more frugal living, then I think we will have a, a more happy life for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Catherine, please come and join us. Wonderful to see you. <laughs> yes, hello. Nice yes. to see you too. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Oh my God, <laughs> I'm so I'm so humble. <laughs> thank you so much for being here. Thank mm. you, my pleasure. Thank you, really. Um, I'd like you to address me as a, a scholar from the so-called South. Okay. You know, we have been filled with, with almost hatred of ourselves because of centuries and centuries of self being implanted into us. Now it is reaping its benefit in the, in the sense that we are all locked to the gaze of the oppressor. We all are criticizing the oppressor all the time, all the time, all the time. And I'd like you to join me in turning this sort of uh, almost, um, uh, almost uh, a gaze to the oppressor all the time into a healing uh, uh, energy that can 
work for both the oppressed and the oppressor at the same time. Very good, very good. Can, can you help me? No, I think you have said it. You have said it beautifully. Oh, That's a radical love. That's my book. The, the, my new book is Radical Love is exactly that. That's something we have to do so that oppressor and oppressed come together and be happy together rather than just condemning the oppressor and, 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 and not working together. So with your radical love, you can find a way um, to work together. An oppressor is as a victim as the oppressed is a victim. So we have to have a compassion and kindness to the oppressor. Uh, for the oppressor so that they can be free of uh, exploiting and oppressing and, and be happy. So we need to wish and pray for the happiness and, and a wisdom for the oppressor as much as wisdom and happiness of the oppressed. So you have just said it rightly and I totally agree with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. May, I just, may I just add one thing that I think is a psycho psychological truth, which is that we can be victims, but if we integrate the role of the victim so that in a way we, and this is gonna sound weird, we get not even comfortable, that's strange, attached to being a victim, then we go in the world looking for oppressors so that this game of mirrors continues. And so let's be very careful when we call ourselves victims of whatever, because perhaps that's a, a really dangerous game we are unconsciously playing with other people. Good. Thank, Thank you, you, Catherine. Thank you for coming in, Catherine. Beautiful. Uh, Joy, would you like to come in? Yes. Thank you, Satish. Uh, good evening and a wonderful conversation arranged here. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, one quick question. This is something which, uh, when I was studying in the university, the teachers told us. I think um, one of the existential crises which we are describing, man's position in the cosmos, or man as an individual structure, how he is reacting with the background, which is the cosmos. Um, I was been told that man, in trying to be something more than man, ends up in becoming less than. So what yes. we find today with chat GPT and AI and all that, we are trying to acquire some superpowers so that we can influence nature in a big way, right? Manipulate nature in a big way. But if I look at nature as nature is, as in Buddhism is said, um, um, Tata, it's, it's, it's just like things as they are. If there is a big tsunami taking place over here, we know it's pass judgment on nature, and um, if you're going to use the term supraethical, uh, which is beyond any judgment, it's non-judgmental. So until and unless we find a common ground with one concept, Consciousness, uh, non dualism, um, and a non judgmental uh, uh, domain, I think it will be very hard for us uh, to come up uh, with solutions because uh, the problem itself gives us the solutions, but we are not looking in the right direction. And the second point would be uh, the shift from sympathy to empathy is a big shift. And shift then from on. empathy to the shift from sympathy to empathy is a big shift. Yeah. Because there are mirror neurons involved. And from empathy to karuna or compassion is a quantum jump. Mm -hmm. So there, because there are certain studies in nursing homes and in top hospitals in the US, where the nurses are working 24 into 7 to, and when the pandemic was going on, and they were unable to give their last input because they've exhausted themselves. So they were sympathetic, they use their empathy. But then finally, they, they were becoming immobile because that karuna, which we would have talked about, that I think is rooted in fundamental wisdom and spirituality. Uh, that healing love. Um, Thank you. Thank so you, Joy. Thank you. Yeah. Satish, yeah. would you like you, to You know, you have put it very well. You have put it very well. Well done. First and foremost, what your first point is, we have to think of our cosmic consciousness. We are... Our whole cosmos is our country. Our country is not just Italy or Spain or England or India. A whole cosmos is our country. Whole planet is our home. Home is not only where you live. Whole planet is our home. And our nature is our nationality. 
not being Indian, Chinese, Russian, they are all secondary identities. The primary identity is that nature is our nationality and the love is our religion beyond Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, uh, uh, Taoism, whatever ism. Beyond that, love is our religion. So that's a kind of cosmic consciousness and cosmic mind is a magnanimous mind. Cosmic mind is a magnanimous mind. So, so you put it very well. So thank you for your, your sharing, your wisdom. And also what you put it very beautifully, that from uh, sympathy to empathy to compassion. That's a great journey. And when we can develop compassion for all sentient beings without discrimination, without judgment, then we are at a kind of um, a level of consciousness, which is the kind of, uh, kind of transcendental. And so I think you have put it very well. Thank you for your contribution. Thank you for coming in. Uh, Bernard Carr, would you like to come in? Uh, thank you. Uh, Satish, thank you so much. It was such a, a, an inspiring uh, talk. And there's so many things I could ask about, but I just want to ask about one particular notion. And you introduced this idea that one should try and get rid of isms. Yeah. I, I'd never thought of this concept of wasm before. It's a beautiful <laughs> idea. And indeed, one could replace various isms by wasms, like materialism becomes material wasm and things like that. Yeah, yeah. But also, I find it, I found it slightly puzzling because I can understand that there are very is many isms which are sort of go against each other. So you have capitalism versus communism. You, you might have... Um, materialism versus post most materialism and atheism versus theism and things like that and i can yeah. understand that where there's a direct conflict one is saying you want to transcend that complex yeah. love them both in some sense yeah 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 but yeah. sometimes there's some isms which one feels are quite good i mean like activism activism you, yeah. you are you're an, a, an embodiment of activism and uh Passivism, which in some sense you might think was the opposite of activism, but it actually, one thinks of that as being positive. And when I look at myself, I find, I'm, unfortunately, I seem to be a bundle of isms, um, you know, and, and so I'd be interested if you could just qualify, are isms always bad or so, are some isms useful? Okay, thank you, Bernard, and nice to see you. Um, and thank you for your good question. I would say that when you put ism after a word, you are making a single truth standing higher than other truths. Whereas I feel and believe that there are many, many truths and each person and each idea has a grain of truth and we should celebrate that truth. So even I would say pacifism or uh, activism, ism, so pacifism means that only way and the right way is peace and no other way. But that's not correct. There are many different ways. If you take Bhagavad Gita, uh, and there is a kind of, uh, there is a kind of um, a place for conflict as well. So, and the same is with the activism. There is a time for passive, um, being passive, being silent, being meditative, uh, being non-active. So I would say any word, when you put ism with, with it, associate ism with it, you're putting that one word, that one idea, that one concept higher than all other concepts. So if I'm an activist, if I believe in activism, I would say everybody has to be activist all the time, but that's not the case. Um, the Buddha was meditating uh, for years and years and years. And there are many, many other people who don't uh, become so-called activist. So, Bernard, I would say that I try to free myself from all isms and celebrate multiplicity of truths and, and a plurality of truths. I'm more pluralist and ism is a, is a singularist, a kind of monoculture. Um, the moment you say ism, it becomes a monoculture. Whereas I want a multicultural, multiple truth, a plurality of truths. And, and that way, uh, all ism should become wasm. Satish, that is very helpful. Thank you so much for that yeah. elaboration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard, for coming in. Um, now we can go to uh, Spyridon. 
Thank you. Spiridon is my name. Um, thank you very much, uh, Satish. It was a wonderful talk. And um, I got a lot of ideas to think about. Um, I have a particular question about intuition. Yes. Um, you mentioned many times this, yes. or a few, few times this word, and there is a whole philosophy about intuition. Um, I would like to, um, to, to hear a little about your understanding of intuition, especially if you think that there is a contrast or maybe a relationship to intellectual, to, 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 to intellect or intelligence yeah. Yeah, yeah. or yeah. conceptual thinking. Yeah, yeah. The intuition is like a seed. You know, yeah. oak tree. Oak tree is in the acorn. It's a seed. Mm -hmm. And you don't see a tree in the acorn. You don't see it. And not all, all acorns will become oak tree. But each and every acorn has a potential to be an oak tree, but it may never become oak tree. In the same way, it's a kind of inner wisdom. It's a kind of inner kind of be, be, before intellect, before uh, reason, before analysis, before uh, kind of um, uh, any, anything, before any mental uh, um, um, formulation of idea. There's a kind of seed of an idea. For example, uh, I was a good friend with James Lovelock. He was my neighbor. And we used to have a lunch together and uh, walk together by the sea and so on. And he said to me that Gaia, theory of Gaia, did not come to him as a kind of scientific, analytical, rational idea. It came for as a intuition, a kind of feeling, intuition. And then he used his intellect, he used his reason, he used his science, he used experiments, he used analysis, and came up with a theory of Gaia. But it came as an intuition. In the same way, I know some poets, and the word of poetry comes intuitively. It's like inner, inner wisdom. Uh, you don't know any rational and, and intellectual or academic um, uh, theory behind it. Just a kind of sense, a kind of feeling, a kind of seed of an idea, seed of something. And then you develop it and it becomes part of your intellect. So intuition, is, so all our wisdom, all our knowledge, all our ideas, all our philosophies, they come like all trees come from the seed. All our matured and developed and, and, and a kind of evolved ideas come from intuition. But we in the West don't cultivate our intuition. We don't pay enough attention to our intuition. We are just learning ideas in the schools and universities and analysis, analogy, analysis and, and all that. So we need to pay more attention to intuition in order to rise uh, and evolve at, at a higher level. So that's for me, it's intuition. Thank you. I would like to say hi to Spiridon, who's a friend hi. of mine. I wasn't expecting mm -hmm. to see you here. And also to say to the audience that in my estimation, Spiridon Koutroufinis is one of the best living philosophers <laughs> when it comes to understanding intuition and intellect. He is okay. a, true, a true Bergsonian and a true Whiteheadian. And okay. he's my person to go to. Okay. When I need to go deeper into white yeah, okay. and so yeah, nice I'm really to meet honored you. to see you here. Nice and to you meet can see you. His, humil his humility asking about intuition, where when he's written hundreds of pages about it, and well, he's truly remarkable. So I just wanted to say that. Oh, thank you, thank you. I'm, I'm sure you know better than I do, but I said my my piece. Yeah, of thank course, you. of course. Nice yeah. to meet you. Okay. May I say? Something just just one second <laughs> or yeah. ten seconds. So I have I I, I didn't write uh, hundreds of pages about intuition. This is uh, how Alex sees my my contribution to our discussions. But so okay, thank you very much for what you said about intuition. Um, it I think it is a, a form of inner wisdom. We yeah, don't know. Wisdom. Yeah. Where it comes from, we don't know that, but it is there. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Spiridon. Uh, Manfred, please come in. So thank you so much. It's, I'm, I'm really deeply, very, very deeply touched with what I heard from both of you. 
And uh, for, for me, it is the learning process is not to try to get holy or to try to get different, but to learn about my inner world, what's, what's going inside of me. And the transformation process is a kind of secondary process, which comes as a kind of automatic thing when I see what is going on, how I co construct the world. And when I'm in touch with other people, to, it means for me to, to show as much of myself, to be as vulnerable as myself, and at the same time accepting when I'm not able to do it. What do you think about it? <clears throat> that you have put it very beautifully. The inner transformation is, is the key. And without inner transformation, outer transformation doesn't work. We can change institutions. We can change laws. We can change um, organizations. We can change methodology. We can change all these things. And still no real change comes. It's the kind of inner change is a change of mindset. It's inner change, a change of heart. Inner change is a change of our consciousness. When consciousness, heart, mindset, worldviews, these are not changed. And you just change external rules and regulations and, and the parameters and, and, and a kind of practices and so on. They are very superficial. So I would agree totally with you. And you have put it in, a, in a, your finger on the right place that uh, it's an inner transformation. We have to change our consciousness, our mindset, our worldview, our paradigm, inner pra paradigm change. Then external change will follow. Uh, but uh, just by changing externally, without changing internally, there is no real change. Thank you. That, you you have made you. a big point. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. Manfred, let me just add to these that what you just said confirms or validates what we're trying to do here now. Because sharing ideas, we can usually say, okay, I see it. We use the, the, the metaphor of vision, right? I see it. But when you say I've been touched, well, that's a, that's another that's another thing. That's a different level, and I'm I'm really honored if what we're doing here touches each other. It it means yes. it goes beyond ideas. It goes through the heart, also yes. with ideas. So thank you for sharing that with yes. us. Thank you, thank you, wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Hugh, please come in. Uh, I'm Hello? just looking at words here about the host has spotlighted your video. Oh, I see. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Satish. It, it's a pleasure to see you again after actually many years. I've enjoyed so many candles at Schumacher College at your at your hosting. Thank you. And, thank you. And nice to see you too again. Yeah. I, I just wondered if you could speak uh, just briefly about delusion and attachment. You didn't use either of those words. I, I might have expected you to because you spoke of matter and the rootedness of matter. And the, 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 the yang of the yin of that is that we, our rootedness becomes an attachment that we just cannot let go. We are rootedly Ukrainian. We are rootedly uh, attached to that which we passionately uphold and lose lose sight of the attachment being the the corruption of uh, a willingness to see the other yes. so I, I i i would be grateful if you could speak a little about attachment in that context and the other is the delusion uh, that you we cannot always know our intention i learned enough from my modest study of david bohm's work Yes. But when we speak of intention, the intentions are really not known to us, that we act on intentions which are much more complex than what we imagine to be our will. 
Yeah. And so, and when we suffer delusion to think that we can advance our intentions as if they were exclusively ours. So yeah. I wonder if you could speak of delusion and attachment yeah. by way of closing That's, out. Thank you for reaching such a, a depth of discussion. Mm. And uh, I won't take too much time because you can ho spend a whole evening. We can have mm. another session talking about detachment and delusion, uh, maybe another time. But very briefly, I would say is that there is a difference between engagement and attachment. Uh. For example, at the moment, we are engaged in discussion together. We are engaged in exploration together, but we are not attached to each other. We are not attached to any ideas. We are not attached to any philosophy. We are not attached to any religion. We are engaged. So engagement is necessary. We need to engage with each other and, and have a conversation, have, have a kind of uh, communication, have, um, have discussion, have dialogue. Uh, David Bohm and I had a great honor of meeting him and yeah. he came to Schumacher yeah. College and, yeah. and, and, uh, and uh, he was a wonderful, he also wrote about dialogue. And so dialogue is in engagement rather than attach attachment is like glued to something. You get glued and you don't separate yourself. But in dialogue, you are exploring ideas without being possessive about your ideas. So uh, attachment brings possessiveness, ownership. I own this idea. This is my idea. This is my nation. This is my identity. All that becomes very narrow. And therefore, um, if you have a kind of uh, inclusive mind, a broad, magnanimous mind, a big mind, then you are engaged with life, you're engaged with people, you're engaged with your family, you're engaged with your country, but you are not attached. So I agree totally with you that engagement is, is uh, the way forward uh, for us rather than being attached. But delusion is a similar um, problem because when we think that um, this is the truth and, and uh, this is the way, uh, only way and no other way, that's a kind of delusion. And, mm -hmm. and, and intention has a part of that. So we, we become deluded. And, and the, the, lots of us suffer from delusion. Economic growth is a delusion. We think that by having more economic growth, we will be happy. That's a delusion. America and, and England and Europe generally are richest countries in the world. Uh, number one economy is America, and yet not enough. That's a delusion. They think that more economic growth, more economic growth, more economic growth. They, they are the greatest military power in the world. Pentagon spends more money on armaments and weapons than the rest of the world put together. And yet they feel that's not enough and they don't have mm -hmm. enough power. And in spite of all that power, they could not win war in Vietnam. They could not win war in Afghanistan. They could not win war in Iraq, whatever. So that's a delusion that you have uh, faith in military power, or money power, or economic growth, or something else. So we live a lot in delusion, and, and, and a lot of our intentions are delusory. And so mm -hmm. we need to rise above those delusions and attachments, and, yeah. and be engaged and explore, but not get deluded that there is only one way to go forward. Mm -hmm. There are many ways, and, and we have to be open, and we have to be generous, and, we have to, and this is why we have to be loving. We can discuss this the whole evening, but in brief, this is what I would say. Thank you. Thank you, Satish, and thank you, Hugh, for coming yeah. in. Good, good question. All right. Um, do you both have any closing remarks? Um, I would only say that I'm delighted to be reconnected with Pari and, and, and having this wonderful discussion um, and Alex has asked some very good questions and very good comments and very good contribution of your own. And so thank you for giving me this honor and pleasure and privilege of being part of Pari. And I wish you um, strength to strength and may you uh, help and serve and evolve ideas and spread love uh, around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Satish. I'll just add that being in conversation with you makes me realize that the future human is more at reach than what I thought at the beginning of the conversation. So thank you for that. Okay, thank you, thank you. That's kind of you to say that, yeah. And thank you both that for being here. It's always a pleasure listening to you.
Oh, Shantena. 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 Okay, Hello. nice to see you, Shantena. Hi. Lovely seeing my old friend, Shati. Yes, 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 yes. Where are you these days, Shantena? Trust, love, and spirit will triumph. In He's in Thank Spain, you. isn't he? Yes, he's in Spain. Remember, once you visited us in... Okay. That's I lovely to see you. Yes, I don't think his internet connection is very good. Yeah, thank yeah, you, thank yeah, you yeah. for coming in. And thank you, Satish, for being with us here today. It's been an honor. And thank you, Alex. And thank you all for being here and coming in with your questions and being a part of this evening with us. Um, we look forward to seeing you all this weekend. Um, it is our last weekend of our program Entanglement when we will have Din Raiden on, on Saturday and Vandana Shiva on Sunday. So we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. And thank you all. Okay.